In this day and age, the word legend is tossed around rather freely, but it is safe to say our first guest this week is indeed a legend. Rock and pop musician, writer, and producer Todd Rundgren, probably best known for his hits, I Saw the Light, Hello It's Me, and the sports anthem, Bang on the Drum All Day, Rundgren has had a long and amazingly productive career. He has released 25 studio albums of his own work and has also produced albums for Cheap Trick, Grand Funk Railroad, and Meatloaf to name just a few of the many bands he has worked with. He has also composed, arranged, and engineered songs and albums for so many other groups and artists we do not have the time to mention them all. Todd is teaching a class this week at Notre Dame while also making numerous appearances around the community, collecting instruments for the charity Hungry for Music and promoting his Spirit of Harmony Foundation, which advocates for early music education. He will also play with Notre Dame student musicians in concert Saturday at 7 p.m. at the DeBartolo Performing Arts Center. We are fortunate Todd has been able to fit the Jack Swarbrick Show into his very, very busy schedule this week. Thanks so much for being with us. This is an absolute thrill for me. I, I promise to get to the, uh, the reasons that bring you to campus, but I guess start with, with a little of the music history first, because I'm sure you're the first person I've ever met who worked with Jesse Winchester. Uh, well, not many people have. He's, <laughs> uh, if people don't know who Jesse Winchester is, he was a singer from uh, southern states of America. I'm not sure it might have been Arkansas or somewhere like that. And he was a war protester. So he uh, left the country. This is back in the 60s with the Vietnam War. He left the country and took up residence in Canada. So all of his recordings had to be done outside the country. Uh, his first album, which um, which was produced by Robbie Robertson, that right. was uh, kind of one of my first important engineering jobs, and it uh, secured my position as the engineer of Stage Fright, the band's next album. So. Yeah, that was a special album, and I was I loved Jesse. I have the third down and 110 to go. Was, oh yeah, uh, <laughs> was was one of my very favorite albums when I was here at Notre Dame as a student. So, uh, but, but Stage Fright, what a what a phenomenal album that was, and and you produced that or well, engineered the, it. Uh, there are no producer credits on band albums. If you go back and notice, they're um, kind of collective efforts. It makes it take a lot longer because you have to get everyone's approval <laughs> on it at some point. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I had my opinions and as well as everyone else had their opinions. And so you could say it's produced by anyone who had their finger in the pie. What drew you, you know, an artist, great songwriter, singer-songwriter, what drew you to the production and engineering side of the business? Uh, I had a band very early on in my career. It was called The Naz, and we had um, a, a stellar and brief career. We uh, lived like rock stars for about uh, 18 months, and then the band broke up. <laughs> and uh, I was still very young at the time. I was uh, maybe 20 years old and didn't really know what I was going to do. But I had, uh, in the Swan Song productions that we had done uh, with the NAS, I had started to get involved in engineering and production. I actually got my hand on the board and stuff. So I was kind of on the street, and uh, the partner of the guy who had managed the NAS found me, looked me up, and said, why don't you come to work for the Albert Grossman organization as an engineer and potential producer. So uh, that was kind of, at the time, my dream job because it didn't involve the politics of being in a band and yet mm -hmm. I could still be involved in making records, which was a uh, you know, great fascination for me and something I apparently had an aptitude for. Yeah, absolutely, given given your track record of, of, of sort of the three central elements of writing music, performing, or being the person who's working the board and, and making the magic happen, which of the three is uh, do you enjoy the most? Well, they've had an effect on each other. The, uh, the production work allowed me to have a certain freedom when I was making my own records because my financial needs were met with that work. And so unlike most artists, I didn't think that I had to factor in any commercial considerations when I made my own records. And that's why when you look at the span of what I've done, there's not really a thread that goes through it. Each mm -hmm. record is somewhat different than the previous one. 
sometimes I may go back and revisit previous styles, but I'm still pretty much a uh, musical anthropologist and um, big game hunter in a sense. I'm <laughs> out there looking for new genres to incorporate and things like that. So that's what keeps my music interesting was the fact that I didn't have to, um, I didn't have to turn it into sort of a dependable product that, you know, was like milk. <laughs> you know, when you, when you pick it up, you all, always know what to expect and you get what you expect. So the production, which is very interesting, gets gives you the opportunity to work with a lot of different artists and absorb their influences as well as influence them. Uh, you get to do your own thing in which nobody tells you what to do. So there's the discipline of the production. There's the freedom of my own, um, my own productions, my own records and projects. And then eventually I, I got comfortable enough with performing live that that became a whole other aspect of what I do. At first, my only concern was staying in tune, you know, and, <laughs> and surviving through the set physically. And eventually, you know, I got stronger and more comfortable with it. And now it's, it's an integral part of my life, especially as the record industry has changed so much. Yeah. You used to be able to... Um, get a couple hundred thousand dollars out of a label and tour support and stuff like that and you were more or less living or had a substantial uh, income stream from your from your records well that's kind of has collapsed in a way so everything's going back to live and I'm touring probably more than I have in my whole life recently wow. between Ringo Starr's band which I'm out with you know right. we may go out anywhere from three to five months a year depending on the mood that he's in and then there's my own tour so in recent years i've been out eight to ten months a year that's that's a lot where's home base for you uh i live on the island of Kauai, in the oh. state of hawaii wow well i'm jealous of that um so let's talk a little bit about what brings you to to Notre Dame, we're thrilled to have you here, but tell, tell us a little bit about uh, what, you, what you're doing while you're here. Well, I have sort of a dual purpose. The first purpose is, um, is to be an artist in residence here and to share my experiences with, um, with the students and uh, interact with them in various ways. Uh, but that kind of enabled the second agenda, which was once I was here at Notre Dame, we sort of partnered up to uh, further the goals that we share, which have a lot to do with community outreach and specifically, in our case, um, the Spirit of Harmony, which is a foundation that has the aim of trying to foster music programs, especially for younger people kids about elementary school age and we've made this a priority because aside from the intuitive things that everyone believes about music that it encourages kids to learn teamwork and it gives them something to do keeps them off the street the discipline that's involved and all of that but recent data uh, especially studies from Northwestern University have found that there are actually organic effects from learning how to play an instrument at a very young age. And so our object is to provide tools and advocacy, advocacy for people who want to introduce music programs back into the schools and to also arrange to have them supported uh, ideally by things uh, by entities that are local so that they can develop a long-term relationship but often we'll be connecting perhaps a program where they teach guitar with a company that makes guitar strings so that they can get the you know the nuts and bolts of what they need in order to keep the program going well and the need certainly pressing because so many of those programs have disappeared from from youth education today right yeah well we've had uh you know an interesting discussion over the week you know about the fact that when programs ca get cut they're usually used arts and athletics are yeah. usually what gets cut and so it sometimes seems as if you know the athletics and the arts are competing with each other for um for scanty resources you know that the schools have but the point is that 
that kids need both and that um, we have sort of a, a common enemy <laughs> in a way, which is programs that may not uh, serve as much, you know, but seem to be there as a matter of tradition. Like for instance, I've, I've held that math is our common enemy because <laughs> everybody learns too much math and they forget it as soon as they leave school. Yes. They spend hours and hours and hours in math class learning how to, do, you know, do algebraic formulas and calculate areas and trigonometry and that sort of thing. Very few people will have any use for that once they leave school. So, you know, loosen up a little bit, teach a little less math, a little more arts and athletics. The uh, the overlap between athletics and arts <clears throat> got a... Uh... Got a little demonstration when you played the other night with some of our athletes and some of our coaches, right? So we had we had Coach Bray on the drums. Can he keep a beat? Well, there were two drummers, so you can't tell how whether, how well he would keep a beat by himself. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But he did. You know, he was on the beat. Yes, yeah, right. he didn't. You know, he didn't speed up or slow down or anything. You know, he had the time. And plus, you know, it wasn't particularly challenging song either. <laughs> <laughs> and and and, but it was one that you could work in a cowbell apparently, because Deanna Gump was on a cowbell. Yeah, you can work in any kind of percussion you get your hands on. Yeah. It's a, it's one of the dumbest songs ever written. I will confess. <laughs> <laughs> what was the song? It's called "Bang the Drum All Day." Oh, yeah. okay, sure, yeah. So as long as you can find two and four in there, you know. <laughs> You're good to go, <laughs> and uh, and Corey Robinson, Scott Daly from our football team performed. What did they? What was was Corey on his ukulele? Uh, we we did a couple performances actually. Uh, last Thursday night we were on the uh, coaches show over at O'Rourke's, and we performed a couple of songs on ukulele, and then uh, the next night we did the pep rally. Um, and I don't know that we've had a chance to perform together again, but I've seen Corey in a lot of the classes that I'm in. So, you know, I'm I'm getting my Corey fix while I'm here. <laughs> and and your uke fix, just like you're back, uh, back in the islands. Huh? Uh, it could be. You know, well, <laughs> Corey, as a matter of fact, has a history with the islands, and that's why he's... Uh, why he's taken up the instrument. I guess apparently their family spent a lot of time yeah. over there. And uh, so we kind of hit it off right away. We know uh, a little bit about the instrument and about the culture and stuff. So had something in common there. That's great. Two two other things I know you've been involved in. One is you went to the uh, Dickinson Middle School with our lacrosse team, right? Yes, we did that. Uh, yesterday, I believe it was. And what did the, things are kind of a blur for me. Yeah, I'm sure. But. Sure. And what did the lacrosse team contribute to your your uh, your musical advocacy at Dickinson? Well, they do a whole lot of things over there. Yeah, Music right. is just one of the things they do. They're essentially, you know, mentoring kids who you know need like male role models and things like that. So they're playing cards with the kids or doing other things. And music is kind of one of the things that they do. So we had an opportunity to jam a little bit and some of the kids joined in. They didn't have a lot of musical instruments there. But we did a little Q&A and the kids had uh, a lot of interesting questions. But it, the one question that seemed to come up the most is like how to tune a guitar. You know, they were very technical about it for some reason. They didn't ask me how to play a guitar. They asked me how to get it in tune. They, they, they may have had, maybe because they had my experience. My guitar teacher when I was in junior high school fired me because he said he'd never seen anybody get all the strings tuned to the same note before and concluded, <laughs> concluded I was tone deaf. You managed to get them all on the same note? Yeah, yeah. That's I pretty was, good, actually. I was absolutely tone deaf. Hey, it's been a, such a pleasure. It's great to have you on campus. Thank you for your work with young people and trying to trying to protect the important uh, educational vehicle that is music in our schools and uh, thanks for being here another day thank you go irish great to be with you <laughs> we'll be back in a minute you use the crowd's energy and it really just pumps me up pumps my team up just to have your emotions heighten your stomach gets a nervous, excited feeling, gets your adrenaline pumping. All right, let's bring in Irish. Defense wins this game. Work for each other, play for At each that other. moment in time, we all know that we're there for each other. Irish on three, one, two, three. Irish!